Well, good morning to everyone. It's interesting to be back online this way, that is for sure. But really glad that we have the great joy of being together and get to worship the Lord together, which is really, really, really great. And so that is awesome. I need one more stand. I'm going to steal one more, so it's mine now. Um, I am going to ask some questions throughout our time. So on the live stream, if you're there and you want to answer, uh, you can do that. Um, and if not, that's great as well. That's no problem. But we want to engage it this way. And again, the online, the online challenge is, is a very real thing. How do we help people feel like they are connected and part of the body, but encounter God? And what I'm really grateful for is that in the midst, in the midst of all of this, it's like God isn't confined to allocation. Like pre-Jesus and the Holy Spirit, like the confinement of like having to go to the temple to meet God or like Moses going up the mountain, like that's a very different gig that we have today, which is like this, and that is uh, exciting. I think um, the, the gift of media as well, I know we talk about this, and I'm someone who has mostly seen media as a curse uh, in one's life, as, an, as a personal addict of things that capture my attention quickly. Um, it is like that, and you're like, oh, it's all bad, but actually... What a gift that we have, again, people gathering from all over. And Catherine, again, it's hard to believe that in Rwanda you have live time with us, which is, uh, which is stunning. And so really, really grateful for that. Anyway, a couple of announcements, and then we're going to, we get to go into the book of Thessalonians, although I'm not going to dig very far into Thessalonians. Uh, we say this every week, it seems like. I hope that you go home and you take it and you dig in, uh, just because there's certain things that I want us to be able to uh, wrestle through. So Again, uh, uh, as you're going to come to the prayer room, the prayer room is open Tuesday morning again, Wednesday, you could look at the events and uh, come and you can be a part of it. I'll explain it a little more later. Uh, Pastor Jeff from CanDo, he, he sent an update that I'm going to put in uh, to the binder. So if you want to know a little bit more of what's going on in CanDo, North Dakota, where Pastor Jeff is, that will be in the binder and you can take a look at that as well, which is awesome. Uh, I, we sent out a message or I sent a message saying, bring your winter clothes because we're going to give them away, bring them in the basement. So clearly with things shutting down, that's a little bit more challenging, but fire us an email, let us know, or we can swing by and pick it off your doorstep. I don't know if I want to spend my whole life just going door to door to pick up stuff, but people need it. It's getting cold out here. And so if you have winter stuff, kid stuff or adult stuff, extra gloves or a toque or whatever that would be, sleeping bags they need, let us know and we want to make sure that we get it to them. And then we heard the announcement, maybe you watched the video on the YouTube channel, but Kidsmen Online is kicking off, coming up next weekend. So uh, we want our kids to get connected, so that is on November the 8th. If you have any questions or you want to learn how to subscribe to the channel because you don't know how, kids at your anchor point. Dot com. You can email there, and they're going to make sure that they take care of all your questions for you. We are starting things off really simple. It was like, okay, we need to get a team, and we have to make sure we have great video production and lights, and we're like, actually, stop. Like, actually, we just want kids to be connected, and if you ever watch cartoons right now, they're horrible. Like, there's nothing good about cartoons. Like, they're like, that is really, like, probably the worst people in animation are doing cartoons is what it feels like. But actually, the kids don't matter. They want to interact and have these funny characters, and so we said, let's just start and let's begin to produce and make it more about the connection and the people, and then we're just going to keep making it better and better. And so there's already people who've said, I want to be a part of it. Can I help with this? I, probably. Don't ask me. I don't run it. So kids at your anchor point, that would be a great place to do that. So Britt and Michaela will make sure that they get back to you. Sound good? Okay. Well, we get into this message, and we're looking at Thessalonians, and it's um, a fascinating book once again. It seems like every time we get into one of these, we learn really quick that things were not good in the, the region that they're in. And we didn't plan doing the urgency of prayer. We didn't plan this to be a message series that made it look like Paul's time was way worse than our time. But it was way worse than our time. And here again in Thessalonians, we have it. This is Likely, some scholars say it's the first book um, kind of of the New Testament uh, that is written or of the letters to the churches. Some say it might be the third one, but it's pretty early on, written about 50 AD 
20 years after Jesus' resurrection is that time. Caesar is kind of in charge of what's going on. And Caesar, if you read any of the history of him, he doesn't exactly love the church. He kind of loves himself. At least that's how I would perceive it. He loves himself, everything to do with it. And Paul's coming in and he's declaring something that maybe isn't so good. He's like, hey, there's a new king in town and there's a new kingdom the kingdom of heaven, and get your eyes on it. And Caesar isn't exactly thrilled. So pretty early on, Paul plants this church, almost seems like with some fear and trepidation because of the intensity of Caesar and the power of, of the empire. And yet he's, he's doing this, and there's difficulty in, in Thessalonica. And then he's, in essence, his life is on the line. And we always view Paul as one that just gets in there and does it. But on this particular book, he leaves pretty early on. And so when he's writing this letter, he's concerned about the young church in Thessalonica. And he's like, I don't know if they kept their faith. I don't know if they still have hope in God. I don't know if they got distracted. I don't know if they're getting killed, but they are. Like, I don't know what's all happening. And he wants to go back. And in, Thess in the book of First Thessalonians, we find out that some have died, that there's persecution that is going on. It, it seems like probably from persecution, there's some death that's happening. He's like, I want to come back and see you. But he says in here, it's like Satan has kept him from being able to go back, kept him from being able to be there uh, with them. And so that's a, that's a challenge. And so this is what it is. It seems like Paul is not going back there. So then we get to the book of, or the first chapter of Thess, uh, Thessalonians. And uh, so Paul, how does he articulate this? So I began to walk through this, and I didn't make it very far before all of a sudden I was captured by chapter, chapter 1, verse 3. And I was sitting in here in the prayer room earlier on this week, and I was like, I, I wasn't preparing the message. I was just beginning to journal, and this particular verse stood out to me, which I'll get to in a little bit. And I was like, uh-oh, God, I don't think I quite understand this, but I think there's something in this that is really important for us to get. And so I'm going to get there in just a little bit. So this is the context of what is going on with Paul. And Paul, in this book or this letter, he's trying to encourage them in the faith. He's trying to give them hope about heaven. We hear about the end times. We know there's some difficulty, but he's like, heaven is here. Like it's like, this is what we hope for. This life that you live is very temporary. Like, there's one that is to come, and Jesus is coming back. And like, all the way through, there's this hope of like, hang on, the hope is that the battle is going to be won, and Jesus is going to win. Like, this is the hope. And we're getting kind of freaked out. It's like, no, 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 the end, Jesus is triumphant. He was the first one that was raised from the dead is what it speaks of. This is the hope that we are also going to be raised and that the gift of eternal life is for those who believe. We get to coming through ch uh, chapter 4, verse 13. Again, here he's talking about those who are asleep. He's talking about the resurrection of the dead. Those that are dead in Christ are raised. Those that are alive in Christ. Hope is going to rise. He he's going through all of these things, which makes you wonder about heaven. For me, makes me wonder about heaven. Jesus, he, he raises from the dead. He has his new body, the heavenly body, and he appears to about 500-ish people in this heavenly body, which to me is really remarkable. I'm going to speak about heaven just for a little bit because heaven, and get ready to type in some answers or some thoughts that you have, kids and parents both, and adults and young adults and older people and younger people and everybody, but kids, I want you to hear it for sure. What is heaven like? What, what are things that we know, I have to give it a little bit of time here for this to be catching up because I, I, there's a slight delay on, on your feed that you come through, but what is heaven like? What are hints that we have throughout scripture of telling us what heaven is like? Just think about it for a little bit. And again, Jesus appearing to the 500, we see him in his new body, which gives us a hint about what the new body is going to look like in heaven. What is heaven like? Who's going to be the first one to send in a little something? Kind of hoping it's my daughter, Zaya, because I can throw her under the bus. And so, Zaya, are you giving an answer? What is heaven like? I just got to give it a moment to catch up, and we're going to see if we can, we can do that. You guys can type in an answer, too, or just tell me. Okay, who's going to be first? I have to just pause. This is the live stream phenomenon. I'm going to get like a real-time app of some sort that we can communicate. So what is heaven like? Give me an answer. What's something you know of in Scripture 
that helps us understand what heaven is like. No more tears. Yeah, tears are gone. That's a, that's a wild thought. No more tears. Is it just sadness? Is it like when you hurt your knee, like can you still do that? I don't know. You can, Jesus walked through walls in his resurrected body. So maybe you can do that, but you don't bust up your knee. What else would there be? What else is heaven like? Online as well. You can type in your answers for us as well. What else is heaven like? glorious, eternal, going back to, and it was good from Genesis. Don says, beyond our imagination, what Paul described was mind-blowing. Ryan, good to have you here. Streets of gold. Can you imagine? I was thinking about that. That's, yeah, kids, it talks about that. Streets of gold. I was trying to imagine what that is like. I, my, my street at the bottom of my driveway is a skating rink, and it kind of glistens, and it makes for interesting driving. But I wonder, is like gold slippery? Are we going to drive? Like, do you slip and slide on that? I, I don't know. Zaya says it's beautiful. Yeah. Paradise. What else is heaven like? Like, what do we know about it? No night. The light of God shines. Like, how wild. Not like Iceland in wintertime. That's for, I'll tell you what it's not like. <laughs> but it's like Iceland in summertime. Anything else you think of about what heaven is like? Yeah, his face will shine upon us. There's no question. I remember when I was a child. I remember driving down. I don't know if you have this, like some distinct memories that are like you have weird um, parts of memory that are in there. Like I was thinking, I'm driving down Pemina. We're just past the, the Starbucks down here. And uh, there wasn't a Starbucks at the time, just driving by. And I remember having this thought in my head. I'm like, I really like this earth. Like, I can't imagine going to heaven. I'm like, I don't even want to go to heaven because this earth is really great. Like, I got friends. Like, look at the trees. And I had this image. And I was like, can heaven be better than this earth? Probably not because this earth is awesome. Now, this is a thought that I had. I kind of had this belief that maybe heaven was just like clouds. Like, that's boring, right? Clouds that are sort of gold. Like, clouds are cool, but you fly through them and you're like, okay, there it is. Oh, yeah, no more suffering. It's going to be physical. There's no question. No division, unity. We're just getting the live stream caught up, which is great. I was thinking, like, heaven, it, it's weird. And then the, but the Bible teaches of it's like new heaven and new earth. And it says early on that heaven goes up, and I think heaven is coming down at the very end, and the kingdom of heaven comes, and this new heaven, new earth. And we're going to be able to explore, but it's going to be physical. And if we think that this earth uh, in and of itself is amazing, take this earth apart from the kingdom of heaven being here in its fullness, this earth without the pain, the suffering, the, the tears, the struggle, the relational conflict, the chaos between relationship, the envy, the jealousy, like remove all of those, right? Like remove that stuff and this earth would be awesome, right? Like it would be amazing. But it's like, why do we not long for this? Like I, I think about heaven like I would love to graft fruit trees together, I think it'd be cool to have a tree with like 10 different fruits coming out of the same thing. And I wonder if in heaven it'll be like that. I'm not sure. I think this idea that Paul talks about, about hope for something that is to come, heaven, I don't know if we've actually had hope very often because life is pretty fantastic for most people in the Western context. Because it's like that, what do we put our hope in? Well, we put our hope into things like, I'm going to get a raise, right? I get, put my hope into maybe next year I can go on a vacation or put my hope in maybe at this point I can do this or I'll get a new job for this or I hope that I'll have a couple of kids or I hope that we're going to get a Christian to be our prime minister or whatever these things are. We put our hope into things of the earth. And yet he's saying, no, 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 we don't put our hope in that. We put our hope in something different, and it's hope in what is to come, right? And so I was thinking, I was like, have we 
needed to have a season like COVID that catches us off guard in such a way that we finally actually need him? Like, we actually need hope? Like, we're now so struggling, so depressed, we, we look and we see there's so much evil, we hear of the evils that are going on, you don't know what's true and what's not true, you're getting worried and freaked out, and do we need it so that we actually begin to long for the kingdom of heaven and to be with him one day? I was reminded during worship of a story that I had read, and, and I'm, I'm going to try to find it. I have the book up in my, my loft in my office. But there was a man who, he was, he, had a, he was a pastor out in the country, I think in Europe, but I'll have to go look. And people would come to his house. He had a healing ministry. And so uh, people would come to his house at all hours of the night, and he would pray for them, and they would get healed. And the government put a restriction on it and said, you're not allowed to do that anymore because doctors and hospitals need to take care of the sick. So you think, that's crazy, right? So he's like, okay. So people would come to his door, be like, oh, hey, could you pray for me? He's like, no, I can't. But when you come to church, he was allowed to preach, though. When you come to church, come expectant for God to heal you. So that's what happened. He wouldn't heal anyone. And you're thinking, the Bible teaches for us to do this. But no one, he wouldn't pray for people there. They would come to church. He wouldn't do healing ministry for people at church because he was told by authorities you can't. But then people would come and they would just get healed just by showing up at church because they would come filled with anticipation. And it was all about God, nothing to do with this guy. And I thought, man, I have something to learn, right? Like, and then it came a time when, so everyone's going to the hospital. He would go and he would petition and one day went to the government and said, how about the ones in your hospitals that you have no answers for? Like the ones who aren't getting better, the ones who remain sick, the ones who are suicidal, the ones who are filled with anxiety, like the ones who are going to kill themselves. Would you let me care for those ones? And he bought an apartment or got an apartment and started moving people in, gave them 24-7 care because people would go 30 seconds and try to hang themselves. And they began to see God do this redemptive work. And the government gave them permission. I went, man, have I ever got distracted on things? It's like, don't make me do this and make me do this instead of God filled with this creativity on how do we now take this thing and say, no, 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 the kingdom of heaven doesn't get stopped by a mandate. The kingdom of heaven, it's just, we become more creative and we go into every sphere and every corner. And this is, again, for me, this is something in my video that I sent out on Friday. This was my concern. For weeks, months, I thought I needed to be in the know about absolutely everything so I could make wise decisions on what to do here at church. And I got distracted from something far more important. Actually, the kingdom of God. You get distracted, and I missed opportunities. I know I did, because I needed to understand all of the different pieces and, and know when it was time to stand up and when not, instead of getting my eyes fully fixed on the king. And I had to repent and say, God, I am sorry, because I actually was losing joy and I was losing hope because I was so concerned about everything else instead of being concerned about the one thing that everyone now needs, which is hope in the Lord, right? Like, isn't that what the world needs? And if we're not helping to bring hope, who does? I said, God, that's it. A couple weeks back, I said, God, that's it. I no longer want to live this way. I want supernatural encounters filled with your Holy Spirit, your presence to walk among us, and let's go help people know you. Let's make disciples. And it didn't take long, and I got a message from a friend who I haven't seen in a long time whose neighbor is not saved but is having some struggles and was wondering if could come and help. And it's like, I would love to. And God met this person who doesn't, isn't a Christian but is seeking for truth. And I asked if he'd ever heard God speak. And he said, no, I don't think so. And not knowing God, we sat and God showed him a beautiful picture of heaven. And it's like, man, God, it was like stunning. And I think this is the hope that we need. I think many of us hadn't had deep enough longing for heaven because we have things, again, like work and recreation and friendships and food and shelter, entertainment and church, and we have all these things. And don't get me wrong, I, I want us to be together. It's not easier for me to not do church in here. It's not easier. We're still meeting and doing this and coming here and going online. It, it, it's more work. It's not a work thing. I love to be with the body. 
But actually, there's a shift that's coming, which is like, are we going to be children of heaven or just children of the earth? Right? Children of the kingdom of heaven, or are we going to be children of this world and be consumed by these things? And my confession is, I missed it. And I pray and I do that, but my mind was set on things of the world much more than it was the other way. So we get back to Paul, and we think about Paul's situation. Here, people are being tortured in the, in the church, in Thess- the Thessalonian church. They're being tortured for their faith. There's a battle in the spiritual realm. Paul is not able to return. The, the pressure from the government, I can't imagine if the government walked in here and they threatened me and what I would do if it was like, you're going to die unless you leave Winnipeg or you're going to die if you preach again. And like, wh- I have no idea what that would be like. And then Paul leaves, and the only form of communication is either travelers give him news of what's happening in this little church plant that happened in Thessalonica, or he writes them a letter. Months later, they get it. Months later, they respond. And the only hope he gets is a message at some point, somewhere, possibly of encouragement that they're doing okay. No doubt, I read the story of Paul. When he can't return, I'm like, oh man, this guy was filled with joy. Look, he's telling everyone to be grateful and thankful and consider it joy, my friends, when you face trials, James says. And it's like, I can imagine, but it's like, no, I don't think so. I don't think he was just happy all the time. I think he was tired and overwhelmed and anxious and frustrated. I'm certain Paul was human. He experienced these things. And actually, he preaches and writes this stuff because it's probably the only thing that works for Paul to remain in a place of joy, is come before God, sit with him, be joyful, thank him for the things, thank him for what's going on in the churches, and God begins to do this heart transformation, this heart work. He gives him God's lens, this new perspective, and he finds himself, I think the only thing he knew to remain faithful was to worship and adore and get his eyes off of what's going on in the world. Imagine Paul, like, of course he knows the evil scheme. Like, like of course, Caesar is taking over the world, demanding unprecedented worship of him alone. Of course there was evil in the world. It wasn't like us where we think there's all this evil plots that are going on, and we, oh yeah, we got it. It's beyond that. There is evil going on. It's like we put our eyes on the king because he wins everything. We have an answer for everyone in, this, in this, the midst of all the chaos. We have an answer, Jesus. Right? Like, we have an answer, his presence with you now. This is what it is. It's like, you're lonely? Yeah, we have an answer, Jesus. Like, we need hope for what is going on because one day this life is temporary and we're going to spend it in heaven where all of the chaos and trouble is done and evil has been One, but there's a mission the church has, which is make disciples of Jesus everywhere. But you don't do that by operating the same way the world operates. You just, it doesn't work that way. We operate different because we have a different king, part of a different kingdom with a different mission than the world has. There was a secular journalist who decided what he was going to do is live out all of the Old Testament laws for one year. Uh, He wrote a book, I've read it, Uh, something stood out to me, and that is he didn't know how to deal with coveting what his neighbor had. As the year went on, it was getting more and more challenging. He was like, in his book, he writes, I didn't know how to deal with my heart that was coveting the things of my neighbor. And he said the only thing that worked for him in his coveting was gratitude. Now, he's not reading the New Testament, he's not reading the words of Jesus, he's just like, I didn't know a way to not covet except for be thankful for what I had. And so every day he had to be thankful for the things that he had. Right? This is what's going on. I think Paul struggled with negative thoughts and struggles and battles, and he turned it back into joy over and over and over. And I think he did it by seeing the way that God did things, seeing with God's lens, hearing the way that God did. More than ever, I think this is what the leadership team or the pastors at this church, what our job is. Help us get our eyes back on Jesus. And so I'm sorry if there's been times that we haven't done that well. 
where we're concerned about other things or we're trying to be wise about what's going on in the world. And maybe there's a place to be in the know about that, but maybe there needs to be a whole lot more innocence that's going on that way. Paul, in his heart, wanted to make sure that this little church plant wasn't off course. And you can read in the words of his letter how excited he was that this church was actually doing okay and people were still following the Lord. Their faith was intact. COVID is stressful. It's probably the most stressful season that I've ever been in in my life. But it becomes really stressful when you take your eyes off the kingdom and that's what made and makes COVID stressful. So when I sent out my video on Friday and I explained in there that I needed to repent of some things, that's what I needed to repent of. And I want to share a little bit about how this worked and I think this is what's drawing me back. In my youth ministry days, uh, every conference that we went to, what we were taught to do is become culturally relevant. In fact, there was a magazine called Relevant Magazine for youth pastors to learn how to be relevant. And we were taught that we needed to listen to the music and watch the movies that kids are doing so that you can relate to them. And I thought, man, that is dumb. Mostly I thought it was dumb because I didn't grow up with a home that had a TV. Didn't have one until our, till we moved here, actually. So I thought this was kind of dumb. Uh, I was supposed to watch bad things so that I could relate to kids and lead them to good things. That seems ridiculous. So I had this thought, and my thought was, I probably don't need to do that. Maybe what I need to do is not know that, and then when kids tell me, have you ever seen the movie Alien? Um, you're like, oh, Alien, that's probably not good. Instead of me having seen it and go, oh, yeah, remember that part where? And all of a sudden, partway through the conversation, you're like, oh, I'm talking to a youth kid. Maybe the movie wasn't that good. Maybe there's some challenges. Maybe my morality's in question right now. Instead of that, it was like, tell me about it. What happens? What went like this? And everyone likes to share the things that are going on. But if you just come in and everyone has done everything the same, you don't even have anything to really ask questions and dig into. You just one-up each other on the stories. Have you heard about this article in COVID? Have you heard about this one? What about this one and this one? You hear this doctor, this doctor, da, da, and we just go on and on and on, and we don't even hear each other anymore because we're just so excited to tell our new thing that we learned. Instead of, tell me what God taught you. What's happened? You watch this? That's unbelievable. Tell, and you know what would happen with these kids? Often, I ended my conversations with, is it a movie you think I should watch? Like, would it be good for me as your pastor to watch this movie? Most kids are like, ooh, ah. Uh, you know what, actually come to think of it, you know, maybe it's not the best movie for you to watch. But thank you. Is it, like it wouldn't be good for pastors, like it's okay for youth kids, but not for pastors? Like, yeah, yeah, I, there's probably some stuff in it that isn't that good. And what ended up happening is we, there was this culture that was created of maybe we need to lay aside some of these things so that our eyes are set on things that are pure. And so I think the same is true about politics or the pandemic. I think we can get our eyes so fixed on it that we know everything. Instead of when you meet people, tell me what you heard and what like this. Actually, let me share something that God has taught me this week. What has God shown you? What does this look like? And point it to Jesus. Miss lots of opportunities, and I want that to change. So how does this practically work? How do we live out the kingdom of heaven today? I've been thinking lots about this, and even, even the idea of teaching right now. I was thinking man, does the church need more teaching? Maybe. I, I think we have lots of teaching here. We have lots of teaching online that we can go to. And there's lots of teaching. I think there's teaching that leads us to the practical that is actually really important. So how do we practically live out today the building of the kingdom? Pull out your phones, pull out your tablets, pull out whatever it is, your computer or something, or a little notepad or whatever it is. Actually, I'd like to just ask God to bring to mind someone that needs encouragement. This morning alone, three different people, before service has started, sent me a message saying, Donovan, I just wanted you to know I was praying for you this morning, and God gave me this verse for you today. Three different people did that this morning already. You know what it does inside when someone gives that? Like, it's like, 
It's unbelievable. One this morning was, Donovan, you've been on my mind lots. Here's a passage out of 1 Timothy 2 as I was praying, or 1 Timothy, I was praying for you, that we need to pray for our leaders and pray for those that politicians or pray for the leaders of the country so that we can live in a land of peace. That's a really rough paraphrase. You're like, yes, this is the reminder that we need to get our eyes on the right things. Actually, to encourage is probably the best thing to at least begin on building the kingdom. Why? Because everyone has enough critical. We all hear the voice in here, right? You suck. You're not good enough. Look what you did. You're a bad Christian. You should read your Bible more. I can't believe you don't evangelize. You know, that, 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 right? Like all of these things. We know the last thing we need is someone else to come and tell us the same things we already hate, right? That, That we already struggle in. Actually, what is brilliant is someone who encourages you and builds you up. In fact, that is the job of the church and the body of Christ to each other. This is the job. So I'm going to ask God to bring someone to mind. Maybe someone you haven't seen in a while. Maybe someone that needs encouragement. And I want you to write them a message. Send them a text or give them a phone call. Maybe you just need to stop watching the live stream right now all together and just go do that. That's fine. Maybe you wait 15 minutes until I'm done. But it can be, hey, friend. You could say, hey, friend, in church today, we were told that we're, we paused to ask God who needs encouragement, and you came to mind. So I just wanted to message you and tell you this. I appreciate this about you. Get specific and encourage someone, because you know what happens when someone gets encouragement? They live that out more. They live it out more. I love it when you lead worship. Thank you. It looks like your heart is so set on the Lord. Thank you. The other day I noticed that you, thank you. I haven't seen you in a while. Are you doing okay? Do do I need to bring you a meal or something like that? Hey, can I pop by and bring you a, whatever that would be. But I wondered if we would do that. And kids, I think you're sometimes the best at this stuff because you're just like, we should do this person and this one and we should tell this one and this one. And the other day we got some vegetables uh, when we helped someone empty their garden. And I asked my daughter, Zaya, because she's always the fiery one to like go and meet every neighbor, every opportunity she has. That doesn't make her more spiritual, just her personality. I'm like, we should go give carrots and potatoes to the neighbor. She's I'll do it. I'll do it. And she's filling all the bags and she's going next door and she's helping them. And the next day she's shoveling snow for the neighbors. I'm like, yeah, there's so much opportunity to actually bring light into the community. And it can start as simple as a word of encouragement. So we're going to do that right now. Okay? So we're just pausing. You can just write it down. If a name comes to mind, someone that needs encouragement, or you can send them a message pronto, you can throw me under the bus and say, Pastor Donovan said that we should encourage someone. I want to encourage you today. Okay? If you get more than one person, do five. You can't give too much. You can, you can always give more of it. And actually, if we just started a pandemic where 400 people in the church encouraged one person every day, you would actually see a transformation that would begin to happen. Promise. So, Heavenly Father, would you bring to mind someone, God, that needs encouragement, someone from our church family, God, maybe a family member, maybe a coworker or a neighbor, God, would you bring one or a couple of people to mind? that need encouragement today. And then, God, what do you want us to say? How do you want us to encourage them? I think God has just reminded me, too, that it might be your enemy that needs encouragement. The kingdom of heaven is upside down. Bless your enemies. Do good to those who hurt you. And don't write it off. Don't just 
Don't throw it out the door and be like, no, no, not them. Someone comes to mind, just respond to that. Maybe don't group text. It can't be very personal that way. Maybe just per person. Maybe every week we'll start off our service this way. Pull out your phone and encourage one person. Wouldn't that be good? I give you permission to continue texting. It's all good. I can't see you anyway, except for the few that are here. In my youth ministry days, we, uh, we started doing something where we had different cell groups that were going on. We wanted to get to know God, and we would meet every week with the leaders. And uh, clearly, I couldn't contact them all. So I would take a list of students. I would print it off. Those who haven't been in youth for a couple of months, I would print off a list, and then we'd gather together. And every, every two weeks, we'd get together, and we would look who, who hasn't been for X amount of time. And then just together as a group, we would just start to text or call or email or message different people and see how they're doing. I'm not kidding you, after the first week, our attendance increased in our cell groups by 30% and maintained. And this was in, we, the first time we did it was at the end of April. Usually May and June is when things really slow down in youth ministry. It jumped by 30 and it maintained all the way through summer. All it took was just people, encouragement, contacting. And the job is not the pastors to do that all, although everyone would like it and we would love to do more of it actually the body of Christ to do it. So when it says in Ephesians that our job is to equip you to do the work, I'm equipping you right now and giving you opportunity to be a church like this. After my announcement on Friday, I probably got a dozen and a half texts or phone calls or emails from people telling me how much they appreciated the message and the reminder to keep their eyes on Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. I think what surprised me most was the medical people in our church. Many of them sent me messages, doctors and nurses and others, and just saying thank you and want to recognize them, but I want to pray for them. And so before I get into the last few minutes of my message, I want to just pause. And again, you can keep encouraging people. That's great. But I want to pray for um, the medical staff that's going on and for our government. God, you are merciful and you are kind and you are gracious. God, I thank you for all of the people who are working tirelessly, God, in, in hospitals and in care homes. And God, one person gets sick and many then have to leave. And God, the demand is very, very high. God, there's people that are missing surgeries and missing other things because of all of this that's happening. Oh, God, would you raise up creative doctors and nurses God, creative ones that would hear from you, and God, creative ways in which to give incredible medical care. God, that they would feel loved and heard and cared for and walked with, oh God. Pray for those that are making decisions on what the next steps are and how to go there. God, I pray for those who are studying COVID-19 and other viruses and, and sicknesses. Oh God, would you raise up many who would seek you? Because God, we know you alone have the answer. God, we, we're going to sort it medically. We're going to try to sort it. But God, I'm asking that there would be supernatural visitation, supernatural encounters of you, God, that as we're sorting this through, you would be the one that would grant wisdom, that we can give you the praise, God. I pray for our politicians, God. I pray for those making decisions all the way from the prime minister all the way down, Jesus, and to our premier and our mayors. And God, I pray that there would be wisdom that would come. And it says that we're supposed to pray this way so that we can live at peace. And God, we've lived at peace a long time in our country. Oh God, we would love to live at peace here. God, not that chaos would reign. God, that we'd be able to come back to this place of peace, of trusting you, God, of knowing you, God, believing in you, God. I pray that many would come into the saving knowledge of who you are. God, would you fill us with your spirit fresh? 
God, that we would abide and walk with you. God, then we would move in step with you, oh God. Awaken us, Jesus. Awaken us that we would be true children of light, true, tr true children abiding and walking, children of the Most High for the kingdom of heaven. Amen. So I said I would get to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Start in verse 2. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. Remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I uh, just took my journal entry and I just put it into, into here. Um, I figure that's a way to allow you to see how this works. I just said, God, what is work produced by faith? Just did a little search, complete trust and confidence in God. I said, God, how does faith impact the way that I work or the way that we work? We work for God. We know that when challenges come, God is the one or God is the way through. It is trusting that God is not out of control. Even for the disciples, they trusted that even when they were thrown into prison, God knew what he was doing. We are to work as if God is our boss himself. If you don't have faith, then you take matters into your own hands. Then you respond like people are against us or against you. It is hard work that gets us ahead. It's our wisdom. It's our knowledge. Advancement is dependent upon you. Raises are dependent upon you. How you feel about your job is dependent upon your boss. Someone else is, gets a promotion, and it means people are against you, and they love them more. That's work that is produced not in faith, but work produced by faith is God-centric always. It's fully trusting Him. It is in response to God. I carry on in my journal, I say, here Paul is thanking God for the work that was produced by faith. Clearly then, if there's work produced by faith, there's also work that is produced not by faith. Correct? This is how I dialogue with God. I was like, God, can you give me an analogy to understand this? I felt like he was saying, God, Donovan, the work that you give people to do is then people working for you. If something goes wrong, they can blame you, me, they can blame me. If it gets hard, they can blame, right? There's always a scapegoat when you work for someone else or not in faith. It doesn't mean that we, I don't walk with my staff and say, could you do this and could you take care of this? But understand as I'm working this thing through. Work produced by faith, this is God calling, this is God speaking, it's God leading, it's Him asking. So when you don't do it, it's actually in disobedience to the Lord. It's not in disobedience or blame of Donovan or your boss or someone else because we work for him. So it's got me thinking. There's an example of a woman in our church. She feels propelled and compelled by God to find clothes and supplies for missions in the inner city, hence the winter clothing. She always has stuff in her vehicle. She drives around collecting from all of her friends. This is still in my journal. She's driving to the mission and she wants to help in any way possible. Hard work, but compelled by God to keep going. Bring winter stuff to help here if you would like. Um, but this is the things that she does. I wrote in my journal, I said, my youngest daughter, she gets the email from church, and within three minutes of the email going out, she's already gathered her extra and the ones she uses, scarves, toques, and jackets, ready to give all of it away. Now, mom and dad want to help her walk through how to do this, but this is what it is. It's not more godly. It's just her jam. It's what she does. Emptied her wallet, wants to give all of her money away. No other question. Just let's do it. So here we have a woman in the church, reaches out and says, Donovan, you want to let some people know I'll pick up everything. She fills her vehicle, going to go to the mission. This is work produced by faith. It's not dependent if I am going to gather you to do it. It's work produced by faith. And now we have a, a little girl in my home, work produced by faith, just propelled or compelled to do it. I think about Jason and Britt, our youth pastor, moved to Winnipeg to join us. This is what I'm, again, I'm still writing this in my journal, and I'm just getting carried away as God has given me examples. 
Working with the youth, again, produced by faith. They're not even city people, or they weren't. Now they have become that. She came having experienced youth ministry in another church in a context where she didn't have to build it or prepare it. It was a program or a a system that was already put in place by someone else who had wrestled it through. And so she comes and begins it, and it's a very different group with guys and girls together, not necessarily kids that are all pursuing God or want to be there. And all of a sudden, it's different. What do you do with kids who aren't hungry for God? Or maybe some of them are and some are not. And how do you do it, which is different than having a group of mature high school kids? What about junior high boys that are rambunctious with high school girls that just want to dig? How do you mix those ones together? Britt, propelled by God, ended up quitting her job, and it was a job that she loved to do, work produced by faith. It wasn't just, she didn't just quickly do it, and I do, by no means suggest that people should quit their jobs. But God was asking. It wasn't a step of laziness. She wasn't promised any finances from us as a church. Her and her husband agreed it was the right thing to do. And it was hard work. There was a number of times, she's listening right now, there's a number of times it was like, I'm done, I can't do it. But what propelled someone, if it was me saying, would you come, she's propelled by me. But work produced by faith, it's God. And it's really hard to run away when it's work produced by faith. God made it clear. And she goes, this is the difference. And finally, a friend of mine who sent me a message this morning as well. It's funny because I'm writing about him. And anyway, he runs a a company. He asked me to mentor him. I've mentioned him before. And uh, he said, would you mentor me? I'm like, sure. I don't even know what that means. And we start doing coffee. And we decided to do a sell at his at his business with guys who knew God and those who didn't know God. And we decided pizza, we barely talk about the Bible, and we would just ask questions about faith to get it going. One guy in the group, his name is Justin, I hope he's listening. Uh, Justin was like anti the church I went to or I was pastoring in, anti-God in in everything. And in the first conversation, we, we started talking and we're talking about heaven and hell. And we started this dialogue about evil and all these things. And at the end of it, there's something changed inside of him. In a moment, in one moment of one day, there was a shift that happened, and he went from being a lazy employee, and he'll testify to it, a lazy employee to being the best employee, or at least one of the best, hardworking, came in, great attitude, from rough to great, and it came from faith. God was doing this thing. My friend, all he wanted was his business to honor God. He could have lost employees if you're doing a Christian thing and they don't want it, you could lose it, but they came and they were being propelled. And his, all of his advertising is about building community in your community. It's not even about his built business. It's like, love your neighbor, be kind. He he gets the guys gathered together and they built a a, a dugout for a baseball field in a little community. Uh, They go and do food drives with the guys and he's giving them purpose outside of their work for the kingdom of heaven. How do you do it? Like, how do we live this way? Work produced by faith. This gave you an example of a 12-year-old, a 20-year-old, a 40-year-old, and a grandma. It's outstanding. Work produced by faith. So I think we have this work that's produced by faith. Then it's labor that's prompted by love, right? So now you're doing the work, and if you never love, it's hard. But if you're prompted in any way, by love. It makes it all the more glorious. And at the end, your endurance is inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hope in what? In Jesus. This is what a hope is for. So it's like God gives you something, gives you a, a, a purpose. He gives you a mission. He, he, he spurs something. There's work produced by faith. Maybe it's in just encouraging people via text every day. And that's what it is. Each person is different. And then we're inspired because of the love that we begin to feel for the people that were there. Our labor is prompted by this. And the endurance is this world is temporary and Jesus is going to rule and reign. He's coming back again. He wins the battle. And we're going to spend eternity in the most glorious of places. So let's get as many people there as possible with us. Right? Amen. Amen. To me, it makes sense. And it's like, no, but what we need is we, we have hope in a president or a prime minister? Uh, no. They're like human and worse, right? Like it's like barely. And here we're talking like, no, 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 way beyond that. They, they, they can't pull it together but God. So you flip the page 
And I end with this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and it says, living to please God is the title at the top of my little section here. And again, I say we have so much teaching and we probably need less teaching and more action. So when I read this, all I want you to do is say, God, is there one thing that you want to talk to me about this week out of this passage? Is there one thing that you want me to make a change in or something to be different? As for other matters, Paul says, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. He says this over and over. I love it. Do it more and more. I am urging you as your pastor to now, I'm urging you, do this more and more. So we, maybe you sent one text message. I'm encouraging you The things of the Lord, do the things that please God more and more. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such things as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Just saying, you can't blame me for this one. (laughs) Live pure. You can't blame me. God is saying, and you reject God if you do that, the one who gives you the Holy Spirit, which is what causes us to be sanctified. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. I love that. I give you some of this stuff, but then you go and you're like, God, how do we love? And he's showing you how to encourage or how to build up or who you do it with. And you're being taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. It's increasing, it's moving from like a nice idea to becoming a habit, to becoming a passion, something that God calls you to, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that no one will be dependent on anybody. You're like, wait a second, aren't we supposed to be? No, we're to encourage each other and to build up and to work hard with our hands and to live a peaceful life and actually deal and make sure this is good before the Lord. And we go to the very end of, in chapter five, probably my favorite passage in all of the the New Testament, verse 14, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. What is prayer? Everything about God. Get your eyes on him. Respond to him. Obey him. Listen to him. Allow him to do the transforming work. This is what it means. Why do we have an urgency to pray? Because actually, we need it more than anything to get our eyes on the things of the kingdom of heaven. This is what transforms us in the world that we live in. Amen? Amen. I want to pray. God, we need you. God, I think more than ever, we realize that we need you. But God, beyond like feeling sorry for ourselves and being in a place that's heavy and dark. God, would you give us by your Holy Spirit a desire to be sanctified, to walk holy and blameless and pure before you, God? God, would you cause us to hunger for the things of you, God? God, would you grant us joy, God, in your spirit? God, I ask, would you, 
Will you give us these things that we talk about in Thessalonians? God, would you, would you give us this, God, our, our work that, that comes from faith, work that comes from hearing you, God, and having you be the one to speak it into our lives, God? Would you grant us that? Would you, would you increase in us a love for doing these things and a hope for the kingdom of heaven, a hope to one day be with you, side by side with you, a hope of streets of gold, uh, God, the hope of no more chaos and envy and brokenness, but joy and peace and wholeness in you, God. The world that we're in is in desperate need, God, and we have hope in you. That is the good news. God, we have hope in you. So God, would you increase that more? Give us a hunger for you. God, out of the things I just read, Jesus, would you in there stir one thing, God, to change? One thing, God, that you want to do a working in us. One thing, God, that you want to highlight. Like in verse 3 of chapter 1 for me where you halted me this week. God, I pray that it would be like that as we read that you would halt us and that we would sit with you and allow you to do a change within us, God. Thank you for this day. God, would there be a movement of encouragement and your kingdom purpose and work coming out of here today. I pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen.